my pleasure to welcome Kevin Rowland to Noise11.com. And uh, like, this is a fascinating record, Kevin. I've been listening to it uh, for the last couple of weeks. And you're really right. taking us on a journey. Yeah, yeah. It's a narrative. It, the album's got a narrative. The character in the first song, uh, The One That Loves You, he's kind of saying, you know, I'm a tough guy. If you touch my girlfriend, it's going to mean a fight. And then in the second song, he says, mm, you know what? That's not really the truth. And then he kind of starts to evaluate himself in the third and fourth song. And then he looks at his attitude towards women in the fifth song and sees where that's been wrong. And then he gets into a relationship in a completely different way than he would. And that relationship plays out for the rest of the album. So it's totally a journey. Yeah. The Feminine Divine is the album we're talking about here. and It really is a, a journey of sexuality. Uh, is this something that you can tell now that you wouldn't have been able to tell 40 years ago? Oh, I absolutely would not have had no clue how to do that 40 years ago. I, I absolutely couldn't have. I was a different person, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Was it uh, difficult to to uh, tell this story then for you? Do you know what? It wasn't. It just came. It just flowed, you know. Um, uh, what happened was after we did an album in 2016 called Texas Do Irish and Country, and I was happy with the album, but um, at the end of it, just dealing with the major label and everything, I don't know, just the business, I just ne needed to get away. I think I'd, we'd done two albums, one day I'm going to soar in 2012 and, and then straight into the Irish one. I hadn't really had a rest and I just felt really drained and I started doing some sort of courses and trying to improve myself, you know, concentrating on myself. And um, long story short, I started to change a bit you know the more I got out of my head and into my body I started to look at things differently and and women differently and um I just sat down one night and I wrote that song the feminine divine the title track and uh then I just thought okay what other songs have we got and we started to look and I thought hang on a minute it was if we put that song first that one second and blah blah this is going to tell a story so it wasn't by design it was just when I looked at the tracks I thought hold on a minute and you know and the fact of it is the first two or three songs I wrote with Jim 30 years ago. So that's kind of where I was 30 years ago. And and then it sort of moved through, you know. But you meant that those songs are actually 30 years old. Well, the first one is I'm I'm the one I'm the one that loves you. What's this next song? It's all uh, right. Kevin. Yeah. The, the basis for that is old, yeah. And then, you know, but we wrote new words for it, new words. Yeah. The music old we wrote new words for that uh to make it fit in uh the next one i'm gonna get free yeah that's been around a while changed it again i mean the the, the you know the basis of those songs was around coming home the the idea for that was is quite old um and then all the rest stuff after that is new but yeah i don't know yeah. it's worked then we sort of get to the feminine divine as we go through the tracks there yeah. that's sort of the, sort of the awakening isn't it it is it is it is it is it is that's sort of well, it's the kind of, uh, yeah, the kind of flowering after the first two, three, four songs of like, you know, appraisal and where am I going and what's happening? And then, okay, you know, it's the results really, yeah, the flowering of um, all that soul searching and then, you know, realising how things have been with women. Because I guess the album starts you know, with that old story, I mean, you know, I'm old enough to remember as 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 you grew up around the same time when men were men and women were silent. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I hadn't really thought of that. I'd never really considered it. You know, I thought, I try, try to respect women, what they say about, you know, feminism and women's rights and thought, fair enough, you know, I should have the same pay and every, all that kind of stuff and be treated equally, of course. And But I, that, I didn't really think about it any more than that. Um but when I started to, to sort of, um, I started to do some courses and they started to refer to women, kind of spiritual, but body work courses. And they started to refer to women as goddesses, you know. And my first reaction was, what? You're not a goddess. And then as time went on and I sort of, um, you know, did more and more and sort of dropped into my body more and not so much in the head, I thought, well, actually, she is a goddess. They actually are goddesses. And actually, they're incredibly powerful. And... Um, and a lot of us men are kind of afraid of them, you know, and and, uh, and we've been trying to hold them down, all of us in a way, in one way or another, you know, just by being in society and not and not not treat not doing anything, you know. So, yeah, that was that was an awakening, you know. 
Will you take this story from the recording studio to the stage? Like I can imagine this being a stage show. Exactly, exactly. The first half, of, we're playing all theatres. Um, the first half of the show is the whole of the album uh, performed dramatically, as in we're going to act the songs out as well as perform the music. And then there'll be an intermission and then people will come back in and then we do the old stuff. Mm. Oh, it's going to be good to see you on stage again because it's been pretty rare, hasn't it, Mr. Rowland? We haven't had a lot of Dexy's Midnight Runner tours or even uh, Kevin Rowland live um, in recent years. I think to what 2012 would have been when you were in Australia last would have been the last time Dexy's toured. Yeah, we did a few shows in 2013 as well in the UK but in Ireland, but that was about it. So, yeah, so, yeah, so... Um, we've announced a UK tour, a European tour. We're about to announce a US tour. Um, Australia's not been mentioned yet, but, you know, it would be nice. What is it, 40, uh, 43 years since Gino came out and you've been here once? It's not very good, is it? <laughs> it's pathetic. It is a bit pathetic. We were offered to come in the 80s um, in the midst of all of the touring. And they said, go, you can go to Australia and Japan. And you know what? We've been touring America. We're going here, there, and everywhere. And I was just like, oh, you know what? I just want to go home and make a cup of tea and watch Coronation Street for a few weeks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't really get either opportunity after that. So I should have just went, you know. Well, you know, I, that I, tour I, of 2012, you have to really go back. Uh, what was it, 1985 or so, 95? When, like it was like 20 years even before that when there was a big Dexys tour. It's not a band that has toured much. Oh, that was no, that was the first time. 2012 was the first time we ever played Australia. But I mean, in terms of Dexy's touring, you oh, have touring had... generally, yeah. Oh, 83, yeah. oh, 85, yeah, 85. Yeah, we've not done a lot. No, we had a long break, like 25 years or something. Yeah, um, I don't know, just didn't yeah. really have the will to do it. A lot of reasons, you know. You sort of remind me of uh, Rod Taylor in The Time Machine, you know, when he's sort of in 1985 and then he goes forward to 2012 and stops, gets out, has a look, goes forward to 2023. I I think I'll check this year out. We actually do live in between those periods just when we're not performing. You know what I mean? There's like we've got lives, so so we kind you, of uh, you you have lives. We don't hear much about it. There were the two cool. solo albums, The Wanderer, 1988, and My Beauty, 1999. Um, yeah. So you haven't even uh, done a lot as a solo artist in that time. No, no, no. We've not been very productive, but we are productive now. Yeah, you know, we. Um, so there's been three albums in the last. 11 years? Yeah, 11 years. And we've got some ideas for another album, which we'd probably like to start recording next year, you know. Wow. So, so that's, yeah. That's as good as it gets. Like you're not feeling it. You're not feeling it. You know what I mean? There's other things happen in life. Things happen to me and sort of took over for a while. And, you know, um, yeah. But here we are. Have you stepped out of the music industry and back into the music industry? What do you do in that time? Well, I, 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 you know, I, you know, it's no secret. I, I, I had um, cocaine addiction for a number of years, and that kind of stopped me doing anything really. And then it took me quite a while to get over that. You know what I mean? So to get into recovery and stop that, and I've been clean from all drugs now, thankfully, to the program for a long time. Um, but then, when I sort of evaluate, sometimes I've gone through phases. I don't want to do music. You know, I don't want to do it, and. I've looked at doing other things. I, I came very close to releasing um, a label, um, a range of clothes, you know, men's clothes based on the clothes that I wear, you know, a, a female fashion designer who, who has a successful female label, woman's label, approached me, you know, and we got somewhere down the road with it, but in the end it didn't, it didn't, it didn't materialise, um, you know. Not I, you know, so I've had a love hate relationship with music, but at the moment I'm I'm right into it, you know. But some of the musical things that you've done over the years, we go back to 1999, the My Beauty album, yeah. and your cover of Ragdoll on there, where here we are, twenty something years later, and a video comes out. You know, was that uh, an opportunity to make a statement? Well, it wasn't just like we, you know, like we released an album twenty years ago, and then twenty years later decided to make a video. It's a bit more to it than that. What happened is that album was panned at the time, you know, mainly because of the cover. 
I was wearing a dress on the cover. And um, uh, I just thought, okay, well, that's that, what they thought of it. Fair enough. Not fair enough, but, I, you know, I thought that's the way it goes. And then we got the opportunity, a, a label approached us in, I don't know, 2018, 2019, said, would you like, we'd like to reissue this album. Would you be up for that? I said, definitely. And if, as long as it's done in the right way, original cover, and can we make some videos? And they went, yeah. So we made some videos for it. And, um, you know, it was great. My grandson, Rue, starred in the video. And uh, it was really well received this time. Was Rue born when the original album came out? No. No. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that magnificent? Yeah, it's great. I find, I'm, I'm still gobsmacked that in 1999 people could have been outraged with that cover, considering that it was nearly 30 years after David Bowie on the cover of the Man Who Sold the World. I know, I was shocked. You know, it was, it was. I think, I think the UK and the music media was going through quite a conservative time. I don't know what it was. You know, it was all a bit, not so much in conservative politics, but it was all about. You know, there was a kind of a guys thing going on. There was a lads thing and a ladettes sort of thing. And if you didn't fit into that, and I didn't, um, you know, they didn't really like it very much. But it must have triggered a lot of people because it, was a lot, it must have really hit a nerve with some people because there it must have brought up their own issues in some way because they got very, very annoyed. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, everyone already knew who you were. I mean, you've been around a long, long time. I cannot turn on the radio in Australia any single day and not hear Come On Eileen on the radio still. Oh, well, that's good to know. Mm. Good to know. Yeah. Nice to know. G going, going back all those years. Well, that's 41 years mm. ago now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get out there again. Yeah. There was a lot of history that went into just, I'm just thinking of the the video that you did there, because that was a Julian Temple video, wasn't it? It was. It was a Julian Temple video. Yeah, it was our idea. You know, our ideas. Mm. The, the, you know, the, for the video. But yeah, he did a good job. And here it is, all these years later. You're putting your grandson into a into a video. He's got his daughter uh, Juno Temple uh, starring in Ted Lasso. I don't know if you've seen the uh, TV show Ted Lasso. She stars I've Keely seen... Jones in that. Which one is she? I haven't watched it for a while. Keely, Keely Jones. I'll have to watch it again. Yeah. I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's she's right through the whole four seasons. She's one of the main stars of Oh great. Yeah. You get, get, go back and check it out. And Gino, yeah. Gino was such an adventurous song. Uh, I you know, I don't I don't know how it impacted uh in the UK, but I remember in Australia we were quite the uh the pop orientated uh, country at the time with the pop radio and suddenly this thing comes along uh, and it was totally different. You know, did you, did you disrupt uh, the charts in the UK like you did with Australia at the time? We, we, in the studio, we, the first single before that dance dance had been ruined by the producers. You know, they, they wouldn't let us in the studio to, you know, they treated us like we were a boy band or something and they kind of, just messed up our first single, you know, and they went, oh, here's a test pressing. And we heard it and we were like, what? And then it was too late to change it, you know, and they played a load of shenanigans. So we thought we're going to take back control. You know, we were only on a two single deal. And we knew that if we the next one was messed up, that was the end. Bye bye, lads. You weren't good enough. You know, well, we knew we were good enough. So when it came to the next one, different producer, and I was there at the mix and he said, I said, I don't like the sound. I said, I don't like the sound on the brass. They're nowhere near loud enough. There's too much echo on them. We want them a lot more raw. We want the whole sound more raw. We don't want all that echo on the voice. And he went, well, I'm going to wash my hands a bit. I said, well, look, okay, you finish your mix. And when that's over, we'll do one. So we did two mixes. Mm. And um, long story short, um, the, we said, I said to the A&R guy, Can we, we want to use our mix, right? We'll make sure that's the right one. He went, we're, we're going to master it next week and we'll see which one works the best. I knew what that meant. They're going to use their mix. So I just thought, okay, I have to let it go. And then about two weeks later, the uh, well, somebody from the label phoned up and they said, we've just got a test pressing of the new single, Gino, and it's jumping. Uh, we can't contact the producer and Roger, the A&R man, is on holiday. Would you mind stepping in and helping with the mastering? I would be only too pleased, I said. <laughs> so we 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 went to the mastering and we made sure we used our version. 
Roger comes back from holiday, phones me up, going crazy. He'd heard it on the radio. Sounds bloody terrible. You used the other mix. It sounds bloody rubbish. But he got to number one. He never mentioned it again. <laughs> I don't know if the other one would have done as well or even better or worse. I don't know. But that's what we did. Looking back on it now, it does sound a bit small and a bit squashy. You know, I mean, if we were mixing it again, it wouldn't be like that. But yeah, it was. But did it do well over there? I don't think it did, did it? In, in, it in, in it scraped the bottom end, but it, you know, it led the way for the next album with "Come On Eileen" coming yeah. along. Um, sure. did Johnny Ray yeah. ever hear "Come On Eileen"? No idea. He never ever ever commented then. No, I never heard anything about that. Yeah, because he passed away in 1990, so he was around for probably He's about around. For years. You would have thought he probably would. Did he have any kids? Yeah, I, I don't know. Don't know, yeah. uh, because if he had kids, he'd probably think one of them would have heard it and gone, "Dad, yeah. <laughs> imagine his son." Yeah. I know Gino Washington heard Gino. Oh, really? Yeah. What, 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 what about Van Morrison with uh, Jackie Wilson said? Yeah, yeah, we, 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 yeah, he definitely heard it. In fact, we asked him to come to the studio and 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 uh, you know put a bit of vocal on it. Mm. He came down, but he he listened to it and he went. I can't, there's nothing I can add to That's an interpretation. What you're doing is an interpretation. And um, I said, okay. And uh, yeah, and, and then um, the, the producer says to him, because we'd put the vo guide vocal, I'd done the vocal down as we'd done the track, and he, we played it back to him. And the producer says, oh, but Van, that's a guide vocal. And he went, that's not a guide vocal. That's the vocal. Oh. And so I was quite pleased with that. But he just said there wasn't anything he could add to it. Um, but, yeah. I think he was pleased about it, and um, his uh, his agent was our agent, live agent, and he said that you know he was pleased and he was watching its progress in the charts and all of that stuff. So yeah, it's all good. I, I would dare say your version has probably had more airplay in this country than his version. The single version or the out because we did a different version for for the single. Which which one do you know? The single or the album version? Well, we had the album version because we were playing albums at the time in Australia. So, yeah. you know, the album came yeah. out. We are playing Come On Eileen and Jackie Wilson said on the radio at the same time. Oh, wow. Well, because the album yeah. version was better. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. All the more reason why we need to get you down here, Mr. Rowland, for another tour. Well, that would be nice. That would be <laughs> nice. We'll see what we can do I'll talk to the agent. Yeah. Well, you know, if it's uh, particularly around the uh, the Feminine Divine, because it's such a magnificent album and, you know, such a story that just builds from the beginning to the end. And, you know, you're working with, uh, well, for Jim Patterson, for instance, you know, like you've been working with Jim since day one, haven't you? Yeah. Jim kind of is Dexys, really, you know. Uh, if it ain't if Jim ain't involved, it's not, it doesn't really feel like Dexys, you know. He's like the spirit of it all. Yeah. So massively important. He co-wrote four songs, I think, on the album. Yeah, yeah. And Sean and Mike, uh, who were in the current lineup of Dexys, they were also more involved with the second half, weren't they? Definitely were. Yeah, they 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 were involved in the writing of the second half. Yeah, mm. yeah. And that's and that's the future. I think we'll be writing more with those two guys. Mm. Well, I look forward to uh, more Dexys news as it happens. Uh, good to see the album uh, finally coming through the uh, the Feminine Divine. And a pleasure to talk to you for the very first time, Kevin Rowland. Very much, Paul. Thank you, mate. Thank you.